Hello everyone, my name is Kurazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. Why did my Seraph have to scratch his head as I was doing the intro? I don't know. You tell me. Welcome back everyone, we are back in the world on this snowy New Year's Eve actually. It is December 9th, which sounds weird, but yes, the 9th is the last day of the month, which means that tomorrow we will have year one. We'll be on year one. That's pretty cool. Now, to celebrate, and definitely this is all to celebrate, I have some big plans for today that don't involve you. Thank you very much. But, let's go check on our animals that we got last episode. Make sure they're doing well before we get on with the episode. Yes. Yes, we have pregnant Sal, pregnant you, pregnant you. We have... Oh, wow, we have a ton of eggs in here. Holy cow. But we're going to have a ton of chickens here soonish. Which means I need to come back and probably refill all these. Here, yeah, we're getting kind of low. And of course, we have the social rejects out here who will kind of hang out in the area as long as there's enough grain in these troughs. And we can come by and harvest these guys without really interrupting our existing animals. Anyway, I mentioned a celebration, and that's what we're going to do. We are going to celebrate by getting into the Bronze Age. Now, bronze is a material that is a Tier 2 material, one step above copper, which we've been using rather exclusively here. We have copper, and we've been using some lead for Melodichalcos. And bronze is going to get us into a whole new class of material options, because we haven't been able to mine things like the borax that's down under ground by our transicators here. We haven't been able to mine out any of the quartz we've come across, and so we haven't been able to expand our windows or make a whole ton of lanterns, because we're getting kind of short on glass here. Access to bronze will also give us better weapons and better tools that have more durability and hit harder, as well as armor that will stand up to more punishment, both in terms of just sheer damage and the type of creature that attacks us, because each armor type and each attack type has a tier, and they interact in a rather disappointing way when you have an incoming attack that's a tier or more above your armor. So, I think we should go and get some tin without further delay. Well, Jasper, you got me. You got me real good, Jasper. I thought you still had some tin in stock. Well, it's a good thing I already bought some. I'm sneaky like that. Jasper, I see you have goods coming in in less than one day. Do me a solid. Get some tin. That's an order. Well, Jasper and his antics and that of the economy may have stymied my little act, but I had the foresight, like I said, to buy a little bit of Cassiterite from him a few episodes ago. Actually, back when we first found him, I sneaked away and I bought a couple nuggets of this for demonstration purposes. And to be real, buying a bit of Cassiterite is a totally legitimate way to get into the Bronze Age, especially if you're somewhere that is rather tin poor and exploration is difficult due to bears, or wolves, or weather, or terrain, if you have very impassable terrain, then getting your hands on some Cassiterite from a nearby commodities merchant can really get you launched into the Bronze Age, and possibly help you step over entirely if you happen to have iron nearby. And the other reason why I wanted to go ahead and buy a little bit of this is that we have some nearby, but not nearby enough that it becomes just a quick jaunt there and back especially given all the bears that are in the area. Let's go ahead and we're going to get this out and take a look at the map. So right in the chunk here where we found some olivine, we also found decent cassiterite and ultra-high bismuthinite. That's a pretty great combo, honestly. And so we're going to go down here to get some cassiterite. However, there are about 428 bears between here and there. So we don't want to have to make this trek again and again, because we're going to get eaten 10 times, or 10,000 times. 
So I wanted to make sure that we have all the tools and specifically all the durability that we need in our tools with us when we go. And we're going to be real, these copper pickaxes, they're just not going to do it. Even with three of them, that only gives us 900 blocks we can mine. And if we're digging around trying to find this with a prospecting pick, it's going to take a lot of pickaxe durability and a lot of time, because these are the slowest pickaxes in the game. So I thought, why don't we go ahead and let's get into our first bit of real alloying. I mean, we've done some, but not for tools. But let's go ahead and get some real alloying going on and talk about why we want to get into tin for this trip. So I'm going to get some hammer action going on here with these chunks. And that's more than we need. And you'll find, first of all, that it doesn't take much cassiterite to make tin bronze. We come in here, we can look at tin bronze ingot. We need 8 to 12% tin and 88 to 92% copper. So on average, for two nuggets of tin, you can add that to 18 nuggets of copper. And if we look at the durability difference, you're getting an extra 50% durability just by adding those two nuggets of tin. So you are saving big time on your copper doing that, which means we'll have to spend less time going and getting more copper. On top of that, the mining speed for stone on our copper pickaxe is times four. On this, it is times six. So again, we'll be mining 50% faster, which means less time spent mining. So I think we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna make a few tin bronze pickaxes here. Probably, well, you know, honestly, about as many as we can make. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. I think we can do eight. That will get us the optimum ratio. So here we have 92 to eight. That means we have exactly the 92% copper and the 8% tin, which is the most efficient you can get with the tin. So I recommend making tin in batches of at least 500, and specifically in multiples of 500, because that way you're just saving a teeny bit of tin, which, again, helps stretch out your supply of all your materials. Now again, because we're alloying, we need to use a fuel that will melt or smelt the highest temperature melting point metal we have. In that case, that is coal. I'm going to go ahead and get my preheater going and we'll get this smelted up. And while this is smelting, let's go ahead and talk about the different kinds of bronze we can make because we actually have more than one option. It just so happens that tin bronze is kind of the simplest. So first, like I said, we have tin bronze. It is a gold color and gives you about 50% durability and 50% efficiency slash damage with your tin bronze tools. There's also bismuth bronze, which is about 50% copper, 30% bismuth, and 20% zinc. And this is kind of a sort of rainbow swirl, darker color than the tin bronze. But it has higher durability, but it's typically a bit slower and or weaker as far as tool efficiency goes. The last option is black bronze, which is made with mostly copper, but also a little bit of gold and silver. And it is a very fine, shiny black color. And while it is the most powerful and most efficient as far as tools go, it is also the hardest to get a whole lot of because of the gold and silver requirement. Now, we'll be doing all three today at some point. I want to get a little bit of silver to round out our stock of silver. And I did spend some time going around between episodes and doing a bit of tippy tapping in places where there were quartz veins. And we happen to have some, if I can go to three, we happen to have some right down about, I think it's down in here, right in our forest, which is perfect because that means we're gonna get stuck in bear and wolf territory, but that's okay. Anyway, you will see all of those bronze options when we get to them. For now, I'm going to make sure that this completes and we're gonna go ahead and pour these. Alright, all poured and cooling. All that's left for now is to wait and let them cool, and we will set off in the morning. We have our fancy new 
10 bronze pickaxes. And a bonus ingot. <laughs> Alright everyone, we are just about ready to go on our journey. As you can see, I'm no longer wearing our copper armor. We're wearing the improvised armor because it has no movement penalty. That's because I plan on just trying to outrun any bears or wolves that come across over there while we're going. And once we're down here, I don't want to be going into caves and fighting drifters. I want to be digging through solid rock. So we will try to avoid caves if there are any, but that might be difficult, hence we have a shield. So once this is ready to go, we'll be on our way. I do have on my back a basket with all of our bronze tools and some spare torches and our flint as usual. And that should round out our kit for going. We don't need a ton of inventory space. I am probably going to throw out a lot of small stones. And tin isn't particularly plentiful, so I'm not worried about it taking up all of our inventory. We need some more wood in here, apparently. Okay. Well, I'll see all of you in a little bit. We are on the way. Alright, folks, we are here. It was luckily an uneventful adventure, so I did not keep that recording. But we are arrived, and we're going to do a little bit of a lesson in how to chase down a specific ore. And I'm going to hope that it's not too, too easy for us, just to sort of show you what searching for an ore is like. So we have here an area where we have decent cassiterite, which is the tin ore, at 0.1 per meal. That is one decimal point smaller than percent. That means that within this chunk, about 0.1% of them, or rather 0.01% of them, should be cassiterite. Now, that's a pretty good reading. Decent means that it is likely they'll be here. But we might not be at sort of the nexus of where this cassiterite node has generated. Because, like I said before, ores and other things on the map are done with a heat map. Where there's sort of big old blobs of bands of likeliness and amount and everything else that goes into it that determines how much and whether a particular ore or other resource is present. So what we're going to do here is, since we have this really nice reading here of 0.1 and decent, we're going to check in the four cardinal directions around it. Now normally I would go two chunks away, but Cassiterite tends to generate in kind of small bits here and there that I think it's worth it to do it just one chunk away. So we're going to go ahead and get our shovel out here. And I'm going to do a bit of a different method of prospecting below the earth than we did last time. And that is, we're going to get down here, get this clay stone, do a density search. And we're going to sit down, and we're going to mine with our pickaxe. Three blocks this way. And three blocks in any other direction. Doesn't matter which, as long as they're all three away. And then, as usual, we're going to go ahead and do our fourth block with the pro pick. And we have ultra high bismuthonite again. And this time, poor cassiterite, although it is still 0.1 per meal. But we're going to go ahead and seal this up. And we'll head back up top. And we'll do it again in the other four, or rather, other three directions. Okay, folks. So what we have here is a little plus shape with decent cassiterite at 0.1 per meal in all three of these chunks. Now that could mean that we just have a relatively lightly populated area of tin here, or it could mean that we're just sort of on the fringe of a bigger hall. So I want to go up probably two blocks in this direction, or two chunks in this direction. And that should put us right about here. You know, this is an okay spot. I'll go ahead and we'll try here. And we'll just see how, if moving in this direction, we'll see how it affects our readings here. So we still have ultra high bismuth and still decent cassiterite. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start prospecting around the area here. I am going to get ready for a probably overnight stay in our little hovel down there. I might just make a new one maybe in the rock here next to our olivine. And I'll stay the night once it gets too dark to go on. But I'll bring you all back once I have sort of 
sussed out where I think the best chances of us finding some Cassiterite are. And undoubtedly, we could dig in any of these, and we will most likely come across some Cassiterite at some point. But I want to find sort of the best place to do it. That way, we can go home with the largest haul possible. Alright everyone, it is the next morning, and I have been running around the map like a madman here. And from what I can tell, it's kind of just a thin presence of decent Cassiterite in 0.1 per meal basically everywhere. Sometimes these sort of nodes can arrange themselves in like sort of a spindly spider, where the legs are like lower quality of that particular mineral, and then you sort of get toward the center, you sort of follow the legs up, and from what I can tell, that should, if there was a formation like that, it should end up right about in here. So I think we're about at the nexus of what we're going to find here, and I think since I already have this hole dug right here, we're going to head right down, and we're going to search for Cassiterite. Now, if you recall in the previous episode where we talked about finding other metals, we were getting lead and sphalerite, we're going to do a similar thing here. Now, Cassiterite generates at an elevation of 0 0.4 to 0 0.75. That is a multiplier based on your world's and actually your current location's default Y value. So right here, we are at Y113. So we want to multiply that by both 0.4 and by 0.75 to figure out the range of where we should be looking. That comes up to be about between the blocks of 45 to about 80. So we're gonna look there. But there is also massive Cassiterite, which is a separate generator, that can generate anywhere from 0.6 of our world, so about 65, 66, down to the minimum, down to the bottom of the world. Now, we may not wanna go all the way to the bottom of the world, but we can find out. So we're gonna head down to Y80, and actually a little bit deeper, and that's where we'll start a search. Okay, folks, we are here at Y77. I'm hearing some growls off in what, the west here, but we're gonna go ahead and start our search. And we're gonna do it by doing the same thing as before. So we're going to go ahead and just dig out one of these in the node search mode. And we have, oh, both, wow, we have so Cassiterite and Bismuthinite, both within eight blocks of here. So let's go ahead and we're going to dig out four blocks. So we have no Bismuth there and only trace amounts of Cassiterite that direction. And then this way. We have large Cassiterite and still small Bismuthinite. So that means the bismuth is probably somewhere in one of these two directions. So let's dig this way first. We still have a large cassiterite and small bismuth again. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna pick up this ladder. We'll just dig behind here. So bismuth is still small, which tells me we might just be above or below it. Let's go look for this Cassiterite. By Jove, I think we found it, folks. Look at that. We have very large amounts of Cassiterite. It is unfortunately poor, which means we're not going to get a whole lot out of it. But we are going to go ahead and we're going to mine this out. Absolutely. After I stone this, just in case any creepy crawlies try to spawn behind us. As you can see, we have our very first mined out Cassiterite. Now this poor stuff is only five units of tin. That means that it only gives us one nugget per piece of Cassiterite here. And again, that's because we're still pretty close to the surface and the more prolific ores that provide more, thank you guys, more per block that you mine are going to reside deeper under the earth. So let's go ahead and mine this out. While we're mining out some of this tin, 
I wanted to take a moment and give a shout out to a longtime member of the Vintage Story community. I've been catching up on her Vintage Story videos recently, and if two episodes a week of the Vintage Story Guide leaves you itching for more content, go check out Hypnotic's channel if you haven't already. She was Rusty Gear, aka Rustavarian, long before I joined the crew, and she's done several Vintage Story series including tutorials and a One Chunk Living Challenge. She also plays other games, including the familiar Small Land, but also other crafting games like Raft and Planet Crafter. I'll leave a link in the video description in case you wanted to go check out her channel. Well, I think by sheer volume of size here, this is probably the biggest Cassiterite vein I've ever seen. We got, what, 76 chunks of Cassiterite? All poor, but that is 76 full nuggets of Cassiterite. Now, over in this direction, we have more large Cassiterite detected. And over here, we have some Bismuthinite. If I can bring up... Here we go. Yes, we have large Cassiterite that way, and large Bismuth that way and that way. However, we also found here that we have some friends. Yes, see them? Those are locusts. And we are of a particular class that can make them our friend, but we don't have the means right now. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to mark this area as having a locust nest. We're going to make this green, and we'll make it a bug. And we'll do Y75. There we go, a green bug for locusts. Alright, so I want to show all of you what bismuth looks like in rock as well, before I go ahead and mine out more of this considerate. So, let's take a look around here. Ah, here we go. We're looking around for you guys. So this here is bismuthinite. You'll see it's kind of like a greenish, bluish, speckled color with some brown. It's a bit hard to see against the andesite here, but it is a rather vibrant color when mixed in with other minerals. But bismuth also requires only copper to break, so we have not much durability left, that's okay. But there we have our very first bismuthinite. And this, let's get rid of you, this is rich bismuthinite, which this will give us five units of bismuth as opposed to the single units of cassiterite we'll get from these guys. So this is much more prolific than what we have of the tin ore. So I'm going to go ahead and mine this out. I'm going to go ahead and mine out the rest of the cassiterite that we found on the propic reading up and over that way to the, I think it was the north or the west, I forget. And then after that, I'll bring all of you back so we can go home and then go mine out some silver. All right, folks, we are back home. Uh, I may have gone a bit overboard. If you look at the date up there, it's been, I think, four days since we left. So, yeah, don't mind me. Don't mind me. I'm just, you know, here doing the mining thing. And in this chest, we have everything that I mined off camera. Boom, look at that. So I ended up digging a little bit deeper and going, sort of branching out a little bit. And I found us another stack of poor Cassiterite, a bit over a stack of medium Cassiterite, and then a whole extra stack of rich bismuthinite and three crystallized chunks. Now, are we going to hammer those chunks into orbits? Heck no, we are not doing that. We are going to save those and put them on display somewhere at some time, or just leave them in a chest to rot. I guess we'll find out later. Anyway, since we are home, I wanted to go and check out the silver we found, or I found off camera, and... You know, I did read about that bug. That is a very weird bug to see, though. So, yep, check it out. If you have snow next to a partially exposed block, you get a question mark. That's wild. Anyway. <laughs> now, let's see if I can remember where I found that. I think it was right there, that rock face. I sort of went for what was closest. And that was it. Do we have any wolves here? I'm going to bring along our shield just in case. Are those wolves? They are. Look at that. Let's see if we can get them into our pit. 
If they're even following us. Hey, in... That's one. Let's get the other one over here, too. Hey, buddy. Whoop, you're following now. And up we go. And you stopped following. Are you coming or not? Woo! Now you're coming. Up we go. And in. There we go. Alright. We have a pit of growls now. Any more wolves waiting in the snow for me? Hmm. I could have sworn it was here that I tested that. Let's find out. No, oh, here we go. Okay. Must have taken from over here then. Alright, well let's go ahead and we're going to dig into here. We're going to make us a little f fake door. Like that. And we're going to get in here and find us some quartz. And as you saw, we had medium amounts of native silver in quartz. So, let's go take a look at what that looks like. So here we go, here's our quartz, and now that we have a bronze pickaxe, we can just chew right through this. Now quartz deposits are often two or sometimes even three blocks deep, so you can often just keep digging and walking through it. And we're going to dig this way and see what we have oh, right here. Here we go. We have native silver ore in granite. As you can see here, you have the granite with the quartz overlay and then with the silver overlay. And we'll dig this up and we will get one chunk of bountiful native silver. That's basically it. That's all there is to it. Just keeping an eye out for the silver bits in the block. And if you're looking for gold, the same thing is true. You're going to want to look for bits that are the same size and shape as the silver ones, just gold colored. And they're typically a bit easier to see, too. Now you'll see here that although we detected medium amounts of silver, it's not all in one big cluster. The silver and gold in quartz tends to generate in sort of small but dispersed clusters. So we found our first one here. It was bountiful. That means there's probably some more bountiful somewhere nearby. So let's dig back this way a little bit. Here we go right here. We have poor and poor, okay. Let's dig across, and we'll sort of dig another channel here. We'll do some branch mining. Here we go. Bountiful, there we are. And you'll simply find them dispersed, maybe, I want to say in like a 5 to 8 block radius, or probably even more like a diameter. So we're actually looking at sort of multiple instances of the silver generating here. We have the poor, right here. We have rich, which means there are probably a few more pieces of rich ore somewhere in this direction. And then the bountiful right here. But that is about all there is to it. There isn't anything special you need in order to dig this out, aside from a bronze better pickaxe. Ooh, more bountiful. Here we go. But yeah, I'm going to get some of this out of here. Probably not too much more. We have enough to work with our existing amount of gold that we have. So, actually, you know what? I think we will just sort of leave the rest of this for later. I'll come back and dig this out when we want more silver. Up we go. Okay, now that we are home, let's see if we can put these things to work for us. Let's get some gold. I think we can do maybe one piece of black bronze with that. And let's get some bismuthonite. And we'll need some sphalerite. Since we already have some tin bronze, we don't need to make any more of that at the moment. But I will between episodes and get our stock of ingots and tools going. We are also going to need some more copper. And we are out of inventory space. So we'll just drop off this little bit of quartz we got. And yeah, look just how fast it is to get quartz now. So we'll be able to smelt this up in a new bloomery and make some more glass without too much trouble. Okay, let's get over to our fire here. We're going to do one set of bronze here, and one set of bronze in here. So, let's take a look at the handbook, get our bismuthonite out, and 
click through till we get to the bismuth bronze ingot. So we need 50 to 70% copper, 20 to 30% zinc, and 10 to 20% bismuth. So I had that backwards. It's more zinc than bismuth. Now since these are nice round numbers, we can do this efficiently no matter how many ingots we make. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll just do, let's say two. So we'll do 14 for the first ingot and 28 for the second. We'll get our hammer that we need, that we totally already had in hand. And we're going to crush us up some of this bismuth knight. So 10% means we're going to need, there's 10, there's another 10, and then we need some of this. And there we go. 200 units of bismuth bronze ingot. We'll get our preheat ready. And they'll come over here and set up our black bronze in this one. Now, black bronze is a bit different. So we need 68 to 84% copper and 8 to 16% of both silver and gold. So that means that this will be 10% for a single ingot. And we're going to do a second set of 10% for silver. And then, oh, that's right. This is a new thing. Electrum ingots are a whole new thing for making certain, yeah, certain new high-tech things. Rift wards. And I think we can also make a plate. Here we go. Yep, for night vision masks and resonators, which we can make now. And teleporters. Oh, boy. Some cool stuff here. But that is for later. Let's go ahead and we're going to just slot in enough to make 100 units of black bronze. Sadly, we don't have enough to make two. I thought we had a fourth nugget of gold, but I remembered wrong, I guess. So we will just get these guys going here and do the thing we do with our torch. Okay, it is the next morning, and we have some hardened bronze ingots and a bismuth bronze pickaxe head. Let's take these in here and take a look at them. So, as you can see, they are quite visually distinct. We do have, like I said, the sort of gold-colored tin bronze. We have the mottled rainbowy bismuth bronze, and a nice deep black bronze. Now, aside from their physical properties, they do have different mechanical ones per the game. And we're going to make some tools, but let's go ahead and start with this one and take a look at the difference between our tin bronze pickaxe and our bismuth bronze one. So as you can see, the bismuth bronze pickaxe gets 50 more durability than the tin bronze. However, you also see that it mines things about 1 12th slower than the tin bronze does. Stone at 6 here, stone at 5.5 here. Now, since we only have one black bronze ingot, I don't think I'm willing to spend it on a pickaxe head when we could just look at the stats here, because as you can see, the black bronze pickaxe gets an additional 50 over the bismuth bronze and 100 over the tin bronze, and unlike the bismuth bronze, it is not slower but faster than the tin bronze pickaxe. Only a little bit, but still, it's there. But I think what I might do with our black bronze instead is I might turn it into a spear. Because look how much damage this spear does. It does four attack power with a melee attack, but it deals eight damage when you throw it. Compare that to our flint spears at five damage, or even our copper spears at 5.75 damage. If I can find it, there it is. And it basically isn't a contest. So yeah, I think I'll make a spearhead out of the black bronze, and I might also make a spirit out of the bismuth bronze for a different purpose. The tin bronze, I don't know. I might leave that for later. I haven't decided yet. Anyway, everyone, that is about all the time we have for this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you took away some information about how to get into the Bronze Age and what materials are available to get you there, as well as how to find them. 
Look forward to getting to more shenanigans with me in the next episode when we put some of this bronze to work. And, as I mentioned earlier, if you've been enjoying the Vintage Story Guide and you're looking for more content in Vintage Story, go check out Hypnotic's channel. As always, my name has been Korazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.